for the talk. Um, John will be the, giving the talk on development economics and how you can see long-termism from a development economics perspective and if they even fit together and how, how can they fit together if at all. Right. And uh, John works at the, as a research fellow at the Global Priorities Institute and on Oxford. And yeah, over to you, John. Great. Yeah, thanks very much, Pratik, and thank you all for, for coming out to hear me talk today. I'll say just a word about my, myself and where I come from. I'm a senior research fellow in economics at the Global Priorities Institute in, in Oxford. Some of you might have seen my colleague Hayden speak yesterday about the idea of long-termism and some of how we think about that at, at GPI. As uh, Hayden evidences, GPI includes philosophers, but as I evidence, it also includes economists. And what we, the philosophers and the economists, and perhaps at some point others from other academic disciplines are interested in doing at GPI is foundational academic research which informs the question of how to do the most good. So this is research which helps us clarify the key concepts that are relevant to thinking about many of the important questions in the EA community. We have a lot of connections and with and interest in e, the, the EA community uh, at GPI in order to, to keep ourselves plugged into the conversation about what's uh, important to think about in doing the most good. And a particular focus of our center is on the paradigm of long-termism. The idea that we can do the most, the way to do the most good is by thinking about the very distant future. So both the philosophers and the economists at, uh, at GPI are interested in foundational questions which get at, get at the issue of whether long-termism is in fact true, and if so, what that means that we ought to do. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit, drawing on my background as a, as a development economist, about the way that development economists might think of some of the sorts of life-saving interventions that have been prominent in the, in the EA community, how and whether these perspectives on development economics fit with the, the long-termism uh, paradigm and what some of the implications might be for those who are thinking about or interested in the experience of Indian economic growth. So my own initial exposure to the EA community came when I was a philosophy undergrad, when I was really taken with the arguments of philosophers like Peter Singer, who posed the moral question that if you were to pass a child who was drowning in a shallow pond and not save that and not wade into the water and save the child, it would be morally repugnant, even so if doing so would ruin your expensive shoes. So too, Singer argued that we when that we have a moral obligation to, uh, to direct resources towards saving the lives of, uh, of people who might be dying from easily preventable causes, given that, as Singer assumed, an empirical premise, Donated, by donating to aid agencies, aid agencies, it is possible to prevent suffering and death without sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance. Now, Singer wrote this in, 19, in 1972, and perhaps in 1972, the, the truth of this empirical proposition was not yet obvious. We had a field of development economics back in 1972, but we lacked very rigorous causal evidence about what works and what doesn't, and about whether any particular action one might take would, first of all, have the causal effect of saving lives, and second of all, not have offsetting harms that uh, would, would, would go along with it. This might not have been obvious in, 19, in 1972, um, I was an undergraduate not quite that, that, that long ago, but long ago enough that maybe it was also not obvious at the time. In more recent years, there's been an explosion of more rigorous causal evidence in economics. A credibility revolution launched something like 30 years ago using non-experimental methods to be able to infer causation from observational data. And then in the last 15 years or so, a great acceleration in the use of randomized trials to, to deliver, in a way, even more rigorous evidence, at least about particular interventions, at least about the sorts of interventions that can, can be subjected to a, a randomized trial. Uh, I, I, I myself have been interested in 
this, this space, and in fact spent two years uh, working in Rajasthan here, uh, in, in, in Jaipur and throughout Rajasthan and in Haryana implementing RCTs for, uh, for JPAL. One thing that we've learned from this body of research is that there's at least a far clearer case that it is possible to effect life-saving interventions at not too high uh, a cost. So here's a snapshot from the GiveWell website, just one example, maybe the, canon maybe the canonical example of a life-saving intervention is the provision of anti-malarial nets, which once you factor in administrative costs and whatever else, can save a life for something like $5,500. So that's um, a pretty, pretty significant um, uh, example of the possibility of saving lives by low, by low cost interventions, where some of, the, some of the evidence for these interventions has come from the sorts of RCTs that development economists have run. It's important to understand that the value in the sort of research that development ec economists do comes not just, arguably not even primarily, from telling us that this intervention is impactful and that one is, is not. And I think an example of this is well illustrated by the, by the case of um, what, what some have referred to as the worm wars. So if you're wondering how the worm wars might have looked, I imagine it was something like this. According to, uh, according to stable diffusion, this is what you get when you ask for a worm wars battle in the style of Mughal art. I imagine it having been some epic battle of legend um, between the, the worm forces uh, depicted here. But in reality, the opening, wars of, the opening shots of the worm wars were fired by, uh, uh, by a study by Michael Kramer and Ted Miguel in Kenya where they randomized the distribution of deworming tablets to students in, uh, in, in schools, and they found trem tremendous impacts of these, of these tablets on students' school attendance and their associated academic performance. What was noteworthy about this intervention is that the deworming tablets outperformed what might have been thought of as more obvious or conventional education interventions, such as providing textbooks or school uniforms or something of the sort. And so one conclusion that people have drawn from this, this research Perhaps, uh, perhaps wrongly for methodological reasons which are, are embedded in the worm wars, but perhaps rightly if, uh, if we take the conclusion at face value, is that perhaps deworming is a cost-effective, high-impact intervention. And maybe that's true. There are arguments on, on both sides as to whether that's true and whether we should prioritize this rather relative to, to other life-saving interventions. But to an academic economist, actually the most valuable lesson of a, of a study like the deworming study is arguably not that this particular intervention is effective. It's that from this evidence, we learn something about what actually are the constraints on students getting a better education. So clearly health has long been theorized as being an important precondition for students to stay in school, to, to do well, to, uh, and then ultimately to work and work when work productively. And this provides evidence of the importance of, uh, of health as one of those barriers. It, it gives us, in that sense, a clearer picture of what it is that holds back economic advancement and development for the, for the, 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 the people affected. So in connection with what I'm going to say about how we might think about growth and uh, economic policy, it's important to, to realize that some of these, these learnings are of the nature, not just what's the effect of a particular intervention, but what is this telling us about our model of the world and our way in which we might be able to develop a coherent theory of change in light of that model. Um, so that's what we think we learn as development economists from the sort of research that we do. How does this contrast with what we've described as being the long-termist paradigm? 
Long-termism, as summarized in some places by our GPA colleague, Will McCaskill, involves three core claims. First, future people matter. That's an ethical claim. Hayden defended it yesterday. I'm, I'm not the philosopher, so I'm not going to say very much about that. Second, there could be a lot of them. Hayden also e explained that. I think the case for this is, is clear. Uh, I'm not a demographer, so I'm not gonna, gonna, gonna speak very much about the truth of that, although I am very concerned as an economist with the implications of this particular fact. And then finally, we can make their lives go better. So this is a, a, a statement about causality. There exist actions that we can take such that the causal effect of those actions will be to make future people's lives go better. So this is the sort of causal claim, an empirical causal claim of the sort that we as economists feel we have more, uh, more to say about. Now the force of the long-termism argument that there could be very many people, we could, uh, we could make their lives go better, I think finds its uh, maybe most straightforward uh, instantiation in claims that it's, it's possible to reduce existential risk. One clear way in which things would be very bad for the potential future people is if they never came into existence at all. And so the argument goes that if you can do anything to mitigate existential risk, even if you're only lowering the probability of existential catastrophe by a very little bit, and there's a very low, um, and there's a very lo uh, kind of low effect size in, in that sense, the, the number of potential people affected is such that the expected value of such an, an intervention could be massive way more massive than any scale we can, we can envision when we just think about development interventions that affect people alive today. So what does this mean for development economists? If you're a, if you're a development economist, but you also accept the, the first claim here that future people matter, uh, how should we react? So should, should we who care about the future accept the long-termism uh, paradigm and abandon thinking about development economics? Or is there still a scope for thinking about development economics and reason to prioritize doing so? Well, I can think of some arguments for no. An argument that we, that we should, instead of thinking about development economics, just think about existential risks if we're concerned about doing the, doing the most good possible. And, and one, the first argument is that interventions which are geared at, for example, mitigating existential risk and other aspects of the long-term future exhibit a very special form of economies of scale. Many interventions, including in the development space, exhibit certain forms of economies of scale. Take bed net distribution, for instance. If you're distributing only a handful of, uh, of bed nets, you have a lot of overhead costs still, and those, when you're distributing far more bed nets, those overhead costs get distributed over a far wider number of bed nets, so you wind up with a lower cost per bed net distributed. No matter how many bed nets you, you, you distribute, you still have to have sort of an office and certain fixed costs. Um, but as you distribute more and more, your marginal, uh, you know, your uh, average cost of distribution might, uh, might, might decrease. Um, with long-term interventions, there are what I'm going to, to call massive economies of scale. And by, when I use the word massive, I mean not just, whoa, super big, I mean something very, that there's very, something very particular and special about the nature of the economies of scale which are involved in an intervention which might be aimed at addressing existential risk. And this is that these interventions have a, a property of non-rivality. So in the kind of public goods terminology, a non-rival good is uh, one whose um, marginal cost of providing to one additional person is zero. There might be a fixed cost of providing that good, but the marginal cost for one more person to enjoy it is zero. 
Uh, an example is, kind of canonical examples are clean air. If you have clean air, then the air is, uh, you know, and one more person is around, then the, there's no additional cost for that person to enjoy clean air. The software maybe in some ways has something of this, of this property. You develop a piece of software or a digital file, you can costlessly, it's, it's costly to develop and come up with the code in the first place, but then once you have that developed, you can send it out to as many people as you want, essentially for, for zero marginal, marginal cost. Um, and these benefits are realized over a very large potential population. So to make this concrete, suppose that there's some existential risk, for example, from, from uh, artificial intelligence. There's a fixed cost of solving that problem, preventing, the world, preventing humans from going extinct as a result of AI. But then conditional on incurring that fixed cost and solving, solving that problem, all of the future people get to benefit regardless of how many future people there are. And there are very many potential future people. So this is a particular form of massive economies of scale, which is present for such long-term interventions, but not for, say, bed net distribution. With bed net distribution, there are economies of scale, but if you want to distribute one million bed nets, you do need to pay for each of those one million bed nets. And if you want to distribute a million in first, you need to pay for one more. The marginal cost does not go to zero in the way that it does for uh, the interventions which um, uh, affect people over the very long term. In theory, there could be long-termist interventions which do, do not have zero marginal cost for each future person expected, although it's a little bit hard for me to conceive of what those might be. A second reason that one who cares about the long-term future might not want to pay much attention to development economics is the notion that developing countries might be catching up Anyway, so yes, right now a, a place, uh, you know, India and other countries at even lower levels of development are not at the, at the world frontier, but maybe it's only going to be a matter of time before they, they catch up. And if that's, if that's so, then uh, you know, maybe improving the lives of, uh, uh, of the of people in such places or contributing to growth in such places is doing something that's already happening in the process of happening anyway. So there's a long uh, uh, set of theoretical reasons in economics for why developing countries ought to be catching up to the more advanced countries. The basic intuition for this line of thinking um, comes from the, the economic principle of, dim, uh, of diminishing marginal returns in aggregate production. So if you have an economy where, uh, out, where output levels are low, there's going to tend to be a higher marginal product of capital, more untapped, unrealized opportunities, such that the marginal unit of, uh, of capital should move toward that um, that low capital environment until it catches up to, to, to countries which are richer. There's been a long debate in uh, economics about whether empirically this is, is happening. Many reasons for thinking that maybe it's not, given that there are countries in the world which remain quite poor, but, uh, but also in empirical literature, include, including a very recent uh, contribution by um, uh, uh, Arvind Subramanian and, uh, 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 and Justin Sandifer and Dave Patel, uh, suggesting that developing uh, countries are in fact converging to, um, in, in recent years, though they might not have been in the past, over the past couple of decades, are in fact on a a track of converging to the uh, economic levels of the richer countries. So these are some reasons for thinking that if we are concerned about the very long the, the future, that development economics just shouldn't be a high priority area. Um, you know, long-termist people like me should, should, should stop thinking about um, development economics. On the other hand, what are some arguments that, um, in fact, if we do care about the distant future, we still should be talking about development economics? Um, one is that though we might care 
about the long-term future and believe that future pe people's lives matter, as well as that there are, are many potential such people, there's just clearer evidence and more certainty of impact when we provide the, the, the malarial nets than there is for anything we might think we could have done to affect the long-term long future. Even though there's a tremendous scale to some long-term interventions, the evidence is not as clear and as, uh, and as certain. So though we care about the long-term, we just can't do much about it, so let's focus on what we can do, what we know we can do, which is provide malaria nets and so forth. A second argument for yes is that maybe some of these development interventions persist. So the, the worm wars is one example of an intervention area where the effects of the intervention deworming have been studied over a somewhat long time frame. The initial deworming study happened a long enough time ago that there are, are follow-ups and people have been able to measure the benefits of of deworming on a variety of outcomes over a longer time, uh, longer time horizon. And so if the effects of development interventions uh, persist, maybe it's the case that the, uh, the, that, the, that these interventions in fact have some, some, some benefit for, for people over the medium term, even if not over the very long term future, such that the, the most future or medium term good you can do is in fact by implementing these development interventions rather than by, um, rather than by some other means. So this is actually one area of, of research that several of us with a development mindset at GPI have been engaged in. Many, many development RCTs have a limited time horizon. How can we develop the evidence base for thinking about the trajectory of the effects of these interventions over time? We know from the average RCT that this is the effect after five years, but does that effect tend to increase as we go beyond five years, build on itself and uh, create other positive knock-on effects? Does it tend to diminish as the time from the intervention passes and other things happen and it washes out? Does it stay the same? Does this differ for intervention areas of different kinds? Perhaps even in such a way that the interventions that seem most effective over the time horizons that we're focused on now, say five years, no longer become quite the most effective once we extend that horizon from five years until, until a bit longer. This, in our view, has uh, important implications for thinking about whether there might be convergence between the, the best short-term and the best medium or long-term uh, interventions. Um, as, as well as uh, implications for uh, the, our understanding of the time horizons over which we can effect positive change. We, we're really sure that we can, can do so for five years. Can we say more about what we can do over a somewhat longer time with the modest hope that this at least moves us in the direction of understanding what we can do over somewhat longer time horizons still. So a third and um, final possible uh, argument for yes is that one might argue that just as there was the possibility for massive in the technical sense I introduced, policy interventions in the space of long-termism, so too there is there, could there be potential for massive policy effects in the development space. In the development space, is it possible not just to do life-saving inter interventions like provide malarial nets, but also to enact policy change in such a way that by enacting one policy change we can affect enough people that the ultimate benefit winds up being massive. And this is roughly the sort of case considered in... Uh, thank you, Siri. This is roughly the sort of case considered in what was, uh, I think, the uh, winner of the EA Forum's first decade review, review post, um, the authors here uh, argued or, or raised the question of whether a candidate EA cause area would be to improve policies aimed at, develop, uh, aimed at developing country growth. 
So the idea here is that there have been certain growth episodes which have lifted enormous numbers of people out of poverty and improved, and improved their well-beings. Lent Pritchett is one economist who has made, the, made this argument. China is a prominent example. But also, I think for our purposes, India is uh, an even better example. So for those of you not well versed in Indian economic history, from the time of independence, the Indian economy was awash in regulations of various kinds. Rates of growth were in general not very stagnant. There were, were in, in general, were very stagnant. There were many restrictions on firms being able to do business and operate efficiently. Following a balance of payment crisis in the um, the late 80s and into 1990, as part of a uh, as part of a kind of IMF um, uh, assistance, India enacted in 1991 a wide-ranging set of reforms, liberalizing trade, making labor labor uh, regulations more more flexible, dismantling the license raj in which there were all of these restrictions on which types of firms and factories could be set up, where and how. And since then, since 1991, India has enjoyed a tremendous growth take off. And in the course of that, enormous numbers of people have been rising out of and perhaps are still in the process of rising out of, uh, of poverty in the country. And these reforms were effected by a set of, uh, of planners. So Manmohan Singh was the finance minister at the time, often credited, whether or not he deserves, the, deserves the, all of the credit, as being really the architect of, the, uh, of, of these reforms. And so the thought goes that if we can make it just a bit more likely that people like Manmohan, Manmohan Singh and his friends will engineer reforms in a particular country, and just a bit more likely that in doing so, they'll hit the nail even more squarely on the head in terms of getting the reforms right, there could be the potential for this sort of quote unquote massive policy impact. The reason this policy impact would be massive in this sense is because there's a fixed cost to um, Manmohan and his friends sitting down and figuring out the right economic policies. But then once they figured, that out, figured it out, those benefits are distributed across the entire population of the country, regardless of how large the country is, even if it's more than a billion people. That's the sense in which this policy intervention might sound compelling or might sound, um, uh, might sound uh, alluring. Um, what are some, to understand in general why this sort of thinking has been alluring to economists for a long time, it's helpful to say a little bit about the history of growth and some of the thinking about it. So the importance of growth and why economists, development economists in particular, have been taken by it for so long is well illustrated by this graph. It compares four countries. So in, in 1950, the United States was quite rich, not nearly as rich as it is today, but had a per capita uh, GDP in, uh, in real kind of 2011 dollar terms of something like $17,000 per person. So that was one of the rich countries then. Three countries, South Korea, Nigeria, and the Democratic Republic of, the Congo, of Congo, all had uh, per person a GDP in real terms of about $1,000. Over the following years, we saw vastly divergent growth experiences. Nigeria, much like the United States, grew at about 2% per year on average. South Korea, experienced far, far higher growth, something like 5%. And the, the DRC and, and many other countries experienced little or even negative growth. The result of that, as growth rates compound over time, is massive differences in the standard of living today. Still, we're at less than $1,000 per person per year in DRC, something like 5,000 in Nigeria, and South Korea has just about caught up to the United States, some thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. So just a little bit different in growth performance, just maybe a little bit of difference in how good the growth-related policies were, 
has, in the, uh, in the speculation of some, led to what we now observe to be massive differences in the well-being of people in these different, in different countries. If only we could figure out what that uh, special sauce is and figure out how, how for there to be more growth, we could make a, a big difference in a lot of countries. So the argument goes. We don't even need to be able to boost growth rates by a lot. Given the way that differences in growth compound over time, even getting a country to grow half a percent faster per year adds up over time to a big difference in how rich that country will wind up. It's the, the magic of, of compounding. So uh, if we're to think about kind of why is growth so, uh, so alluring, first, it's that it has this property I described of possible massive economies of scale. You think of the... Um, the, the, right, the right policy you implement it, and it benefits everyone. It's not the only example of a development policy uh, that which might have this massive property. I really enjoyed Santosha's talk yesterday about air quality. I think this is a, 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 a super compelling area, just uh, my own um, uh, take. Others are more, more expert in that. I think it's, it's, it's really interesting. And one feature of it is that it has this massiveness property. You make an intervention to improve air quality, and air quality is better for everyone, regardless of how many people are living in that particular area. So, at, so that type of an intervention has also the massiveness property. It does not have, though, another feature which, with which growth affecting interventions have, and that is the way that growth accumulates over time and potentially over a long time. So suppose there's some air quality intervention which if it's in place, the well-being of everybody in India is 10% is higher and if it's not, then well-being is 10% lower than that. If we bring forward the time at which that intervention is implemented by say three years, then that's three years of 10% higher, higher well-being for everyone in India but only three years worth, because after three years, that intervention would have been implemented anyway. With growth, on the other hand, if we can bring forward a growth episode and get a country's level of income to start growing and start compounding sooner, then that country will stay for a long, for the extended future on a higher, uh, at a higher level than if we had waited to do the growth intervention. And will continue to be higher at least until growth, I mean if growth ultimately plateaus at some point and there are discussions about whether and when that, that might happen, maybe over that horizon the, that growth intervention will, will wash out. Um, but until then, the benefits extend over a long time. So this is why growth has been so alluring to so many economists for a long time. If we could just get growth policy right, that's been a million dollar question in development for a long, long time, at the same time, you might wonder just how easy is this to accomplish. As economists, we tend to believe that there's no such thing as a trillion dollar bill just lying on the, on the sidewalk. Things that sound nice are difficult. So there's a, a variety of reasons for thinking that growth is just elusive. Bill Easterly is one of the people who's been prominent in making, the, making this argument. His book, The Elusive Quest for Growth, is now something like 20 years old, but I still, I taught it in my freshman seminar this past spring because I think the critiques are still pertinent. There are a lot of reasons for, for thinking that there's, that the efforts of top-down planners to achieve more growth just are unlikely to succeed, have a poor track record of succeeding, have in some cases a track record of doing harm, and are not what's needed for growth if the underlying incentives for the things that need to happen for growth are not in place. You can't dig your way out of the hole by just planning better is the um, idea of, uh, of Bill Easterly. So that's a reason to be skeptical of whether it's in fact possible to devote resources such as funding, such as time, such as work of those who think this might be an attractive EA uh, cause area to trying to improve policy making and to increase the chances of, of growth. At the same time, 
I want to introduce a, a proposition for consideration. It's that if growth-focused work, by which I mean efforts to improve the research, understanding, and policy making surrounding policies that concern the rate of growth in an economy, can succeed as a high-value EA intervention area, then India is one of the most likely places for this success. You'll note that this proposition is a conditional. If growth-focused work can succeed as a high-value intervention area, then India is perhaps a uniquely likely place for it. I'm, I'm far less confident in the truth of the antecedent of this proposition, given all the reasons for growth skepticism, than I am about the truth of the, uh, of the conditional. I'm also uncertain about the truth of the conditional, but I want to consider some reasons why this might be so. In many of the conversations um, at this conference about what, what are the areas in which um, uh, people in India can think about working where they might have a unique opportunity to, to do good, meaning comparatively better than others, uh, than uh, people situated in other places, uh, perhaps improving our understanding of the way the economy works and ideas related to, uh, um, to growth and um, productive uh, productive efficiency could be could be one. So arguments for this this proposition. First, the massive population of the country. Where is such uh, such work most likely to succeed? In the countries with the largest population. And India has a largest population, giving the greatest the potential leverage from the fact that there's this possibility of massive economies of of scale. Um, second. Arguably, and one could make, one could make a counter-argument, that some of the basic institutions in India are well-suited to thinking about improving policy. There's a, a good long history of economic policy planning. Um, there's uh, there's a, a democratic society. There are, um, there's a pipeline of people who have talented e economists who have been working on this already, who have provided a lot of you know, relevant contextual knowledge and foundation to be able to, to make the next steps in thinking about better policy. There's a, you know, those with experience um, working on this. Maybe this means that some of the important basic institutions for success are in place. And finally, the history of the 1991 reforms arguably provides a proof of concept. We, we saw this, or the, the counterfactual is difficult to know, but uh, we, we saw policy reforms and then we saw a growth takeoff. That happened. That's a, that, 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 that's a fact. And people, um, Jagdish Bhagwati and Arvind Panagaria have a, have a book, Why Growth Matters, which is a good reference for people who want to hear more of this, this argument of the importance of the 1991 reforms and how this led to, um, in, in their view, to reductions in poverty, not just a growing of the pie, and, and, uh, and so forth. At the same time, I think there are arguments against this, uh, the, this proposition, which is something like the proposition one might have in mind for, for, for uh, focusing on this, this area. Uh, one is that, 1991 showed that this can and did happen in India, but that already happened. And so given that those reforms have already been done, maybe the low-hanging fruits have been plucked. And this sort of you know, thinking and intervention is actually better in some other countries where the low-hanging fruits haven't been plucked in the same way. And Second, I'm not certain which way this cuts, but I've put it under arguments against. I think it's really important to keep in mind in thinking about the prospects for success in this area, and that's the political economy critique. So, um, Daron Esamoglu, who's my PhD advisor, and James Robinson, who have, um, who's his, his frequent co-author, are two of the people who have uh, been associated with this type of a critique and written, written books about it. The idea is that you can come up with the best growth policies, which maybe can be demonstrated conclusively to uh, th that they would have the effect 
of increasing growth or, or economic well-being, but getting the political system to implement them is another matter. If it's not in the interests of those with power to implement those policies, then no matter how good they are, no matter how good your research or understanding is, they just won't get implemented. Maybe those in power are gonna do what they're gonna do anyway, and all such research and kind of policy effort is for naught. Now, now, is this more of a concern in India than in elsewhere? Than elsewhere, I, I don't know. I guess I've, I've put it under arguments uh, against because it's a general reason to be skeptical of the of the enterprise. I don't have as strong a view of, um, uh, and, and it's it's been you know also my my own ex experience in being engaged with some of the policy space in in India that the best ideas don't always get get implemented. But that's true elsewhere, and maybe more so or less so in India. But I, I do think that. Um, in any event, what this means is that if it's possible to succeed along these lines of thinking, one requirement is good economics. So studies like the, 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 the deworming study teach us some kind of a lesson about the relationship between health and ability to get educated or, or work. In that, in that way, um, these, this work improves our understanding of how things work and what the determinants are of underdevelopment. That's what I mean by good economics. More, you know, more understanding of how the, uh, the economy actually works and of what constraints need to be relieved for development to happen. It also requires good political economy. So somebody who thought that this was a, was a compelling area should not necessarily just or even um, as, their, uh, as, the, as the first thought, think about working in economics re research. It's also important to, ha to have a, a sense of how the policy landscape looks, how and whether research will be received to lead to actual policy differences, what needs to be done to navigate it, and working directly in that, in, in some of those areas, uh, one might argue is a higher impact path in this space than just doing the research, which might or might not be heeded by those in power. So if I were to summarize the takeaways from what I've described uh, today, there is, we can think, a basic contrast between near-termist interventions like anti-malarial nets and interventions which aim to, for example, mitigate existential risk. At the same time, there are also certain in-betweens which blend features of the canonical near-term interventions and the canonical long-term interventions. Things like thinking about growth which are less certain than the, have less certain effects than providing malaria nets, but arguably with the, with the, the right research and policy, political theory of change, more certain than the prospects for uh, um, some longer term considerations. Um, but which have this something of the massiveness property that the malarial nets lack but the existential long-term issues have, even if not to the same extent that, that they do. Uh, I raised the question. I didn't, didn't, make the, didn't come down with a firm conclusion, but I raised the question, and I hope offered valuable considerations about whether, whether growth is a potential high-value area, and uniquely so for, for India. Um, at the same time, it's important in thinking about this to be mindful of the, the caveats, such as skepticism about whether growth-focused efforts can work at all, and about what the relevant political economy conditions are for them to do so. So that's all I have uh, for today, but I uh, appreciate your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Seminars were used to very aggressive questioning and, cri and critiques. So um, even, and perhaps especially, if you think that was something of what I said is, is incorrect, I'm happy to hear objections, but also any, um, any forms of questions you might have.
Uh, okay, so first question is, in what ways do you think economic growth is a neglected cause globally? Yeah, so th I think this is a, this is a really good, uh, good, good question. I've, I've done some thinking about this. I, um, it would have even been good if I had included the way. I think that growth is, has not been neglected. There's, I talked about the allure of growth for economists, and you think about the amount of attention that's been devoted to it by national governments who um, you know, see it as a road to their nation becoming prosperous and powerful, and also by international organizations like the, like the World Bank. In that sense, we might worry that it's, not, uh, that it's not neglected. One reason, I think, for thinking it might be neglected is that the benefits of economic growth accrue primarily to people over the more distant future. And so if, as I think is the case, that uh, people discount the future and care more about near-term benefits, they're going to tend to underinvest in policies which benefit the longer-term future relative to those which have more, more immediate benefits. So that's a theoretical reason why at least some areas of growth might be, might be neglected. Now, some such areas such as um, education are arguably important for growth, but arguably not neglected. Uh, you know, perhaps other areas, you know, many economic models think of ideas and knowledge and technological knowledge, perhaps including context-specific technological knowledge as being the engine of, of growth. And perhaps that's something that's less tangible and investment in knowledge generation is one example of a particular growth-focused policy uh, which meets with the notion described in my theoretical framework about why some growth-focused policies might be neglected. Okay. Uh, the next question is, this person is wondering if the compounding benefits of growth would be considered non-rivalrous in the long term, yeah. and uh, since the marginal cost of a fixed quantity of production tends to zero. Uh, y yes, however much growth, uh, you know, happens, um, you know, if we, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, benefits everyone uh, who is alive in society over the long term, um, or even, you know, even if it's not evenly distributed, so we might we might well be concerned in thinking about growth whether the gains from growth are evenly distributed. That, that's the that's a great topic. One I didn't one I didn't get into today. A valid a valid concern. Um, but but even if not, it doesn't matter how many people are. Um, uh, kind of uh, alive in the future and able to experience growth, they still experience growth from the same amount of um, you know, kind of better policy making. So yes. Okay. Uh, this one is a shorter one. Which other countries are in a sim similar position like India was in 1991? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. So um, thinking about, so uh, what, what would be the clues to that? So large population would seem to be, um, you know, one important feature, but also something about not yet having the policy reforms in place, but perhaps having some of the preconditions for reform in, in place. And I don't know, um, I think I enough of the specifics about relevant countries to have confidence in an answer here. Um, you know, some of the large economies which uh, leap to mind are Nigeria um, because that's large and also growing in population. Uh, you know, perhaps Brazil. Uh, you know, perhaps Indonesia, uh, Pakistan, and Bangladesh uh, also have uh, you know very large populations and are in certain ways not quite in the place that India is. So maybe these are good candidates. Um, certainly in terms of population, yes. In terms of the question of whether the um, political and institutional situation in those countries is in just the right place for change to happen. I'm less well versed in the specifics of any of those countries to comment. Okay. Technically